everyone and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. My name is David Holloway and it's great as always to be here with you. Um, I am again flying solo, not because Paul's got his feet up at some poolside bar, but because he's had to buy a new computer today and we couldn't quite make it work before the interview. So Paul, always dedicated to this show and trying to make a brand new computer work. Appreciate you trying, sir. We just didn't quite make it. But the person that did make it is Mr. Andy Alston. Now, Andy Alston is a keyboard player, accordion player, just amazing player all around, really, for iconic Scottish band Delamitri. Um, I know our UK and Australian and New Zealand listeners will be very, very familiar with Delamitri, but a lot of our US and Canada listeners will be as well. Delamitri had some massive hits over the late 80s, during the 90s, and right up until today, their last album only coming out a couple of years ago with, with another charting success. So, um, absolute pleasure talking to Andy, and I, uh, he provides a lot of great guidance on a range of issues, and I hope you enjoy this one. Andy, it's an absolute thrill to have you, and really appreciate you taking the time. All right, thanks so much, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's sort of a, a very timely interview because I know you're coming out to Australia very soon and we'll talk about that in yeah, a second. Yeah, I don't know. It's two weeks or something. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, 20 years since I was there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah something so like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll definitely talk about that. But before we get to mm-hmm. that, I, I thought I'd start off with our usual question and just give, give us a bit of a an insight into your musical upbringing. So what sort of kicked you yeah. off as, as becoming a musician? Well, oh, right, I've got to go quite far back then into the world. Yes, I was brought up in a town called Straven. It's about 20 miles from Glasgow in Scotland. And then uh, I got piano lessons for about a year when I was about 10. Right. And then taught myself piano after that. And then there was a scene in Scotland. Uh, I don't know if you would know about it called Postcard Records. Uh, the go-betweens were on. Right, and then one of my real friends I met at that time, uh, he was a saxophone player. Uh, you know, I used to play jazz kind of things, but he was in a kind of band. And all oh, right, come into the Glasgow world, uh, you know, of that, you know, when I was about 17. Yeah, and then I, I, I went kind of hardcore with, um, uh, I did a, I basically went to, went to university in Glasgow, you know, about 20 years ago. I said, you know, I basically did that one year of piano thing and, you know, and then, you know, went a bit of a different thing, became a physics student. Yeah, maths and physics, you know, because I was kind of really smart. Um, And then did, uh, well, but when I was about a second year in university, I kind of got a bit distracted into music. Um, And then my physics professor just said, oh, no, you've really got to decide what you want to do. And then I decided to go really, uh, but... But because I was practicing piano a lot at that time, uh, you know, maybe four hours a day or something, um, rather than studying physics, and then I decided oh, I'll go, I'll go hard into physics, and I, I got my first class degree in physics and maths and all that, yeah. And then uh, I had a bit of a break after that, and then I met Justin out uh, Delmetry in a, a, a cafe that I played the piano in, and he he basically had this idea. Oh, I really like your piano playing, you know, just somebody who's who's kind of in the hospitality and dress, you know, carrying drinks and food around, hears, you know, every night, you know, so, and they know, and the, the, the kind of, you know, chemistry of us uh, and humour kind of thing, you know, it's a it's a good kind of, it's not an addition, but it's just a thing, really. And then uh, I was playing with different bands and then, uh, you know, did recorded that Delamitri album and, you know, did a lot of stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I joined the band, really. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so absolutely. And so before we, we jump onto that, I'm fascinated by you mentioned the maths and physics and I believe you did postgraduate mm-hmm. philosophy as well. Yeah, 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 um, that's right, yeah. And so you, you, you have your PhD, so I know this is totally unrelated to keyboards, but tell us about your PhD and, and how it may have just influenced the, those initial early years of your adulthood, even though you may not have progressed that. When I was um you know, when I'd done my, when I'd finished my physics, I'd, I went really hardcore to finish it, you know, and get the best degree. And then, oh, I just remember that after that, I was just relaxing a bit uh, in the sun kind of thing. And then I decided I'd, I'd do, I was kind of questioning physics, really, in a way. I want to go into philosophy world. 
uh, and then I went down to London, and then that that was a time actually when Del Mitri were doing their recording uh, with um, of the first album, and I was kind of I was just me really. I was just I was been playing with them before, but I was playing with different people, and oh, we were, we're going to do an album in this studio, and then no, I want to finish my postgraduate thing, really, you know. Sorry guys, I'm not available. Yeah, and then they recorded that the Waking Hours album, but then it didn't really work out. You know, the, the they recorded it with this guy. Well, I, I didn't actually do that uh, that first version of it. It was a guy uh, Daniel Kershenbaum who just produced uh, Tracy Chapman's Fast Car kind of album. Uh, yeah, and they thought well, he's a great guy. You know, in the kind of acoustic music he'd seen the American. Uh, and I remember the thing just told me about he was the first guy in the UK to have a mobile phone, <laughs> you know, a big mobile phone. And then uh, basically, I was sitting at the back of the studio phoning up pizzas and things. And, and really, you don't know if somebody's executive producer or something. And basically, Justin had the real courage in that way about, no, put that, put that album in the bin. You know, let's do it again. You know, so so waking uh, hours essentially, Andy had two goes. Yeah, basically, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. None of the none of the first albums in that. It just we we did the whole thing again. Yeah, and then I played on it and made it a hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah. and and so yeah. I'm assuming you don't miss the maths, physics, and philosophy. No, well, I teach a bit of maths and physics and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've done a bunch of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, so you, you kept your hand in. Yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, and so just before we get to Delamitri as well, I know you did some work with, and I've listened to it, and I actually love some of the, the songs they are on YouTube, um, is the Strangers mm -hmm. and Brothers stuff. What Was that as an initial project for you? What, what did you learn from that? Uh, well, that was another record contract thing. Um, but that was really, that was kind of before my Delamitri time. Uh, that was one of my first kind of, uh, you know, where it was a record contract uh, idea. I had played in kind of other smaller bands before, but then, uh, oh, there, well, uh, Charles, uh, and he's a friend of mine. Um, uh, there's two brothers, Jack and Charles, and I, I was in that thing, but that was really, you know, these things can last for maybe a year or something like that. And then, you know, we, we just released a couple of records, and uh, I was not really... Uh, passionately involved and I was just the keyboard player but then I was playing with different people really uh, and then yeah but I do a lot of other I write a lot of music now you know uh, yeah so if anybody out there in Australia is a singer that wants to sing some songs yeah I would well let, songs, let's yeah. talk uh, let's let's talk and sadly I can't sing Andy so it definitely won't be me but um mm -hmm. yeah what, what, tell us about your solo work then before we jump into Delamage you so, say yeah what uh, you've obviously kept at that for uh, over the whole of your career I mean what keeps you excited about your own work and and what drives you in that regard Right, uh, you know, I played, there's this scene of postcard records in Glasgow, it's a real big influential thing that there's movies and all that about, uh, and then I was in this band called Paul Quinn and the Independent Group, that people in the kind of music scene in, in Britain, and, and they could look up Paul Quinn and the Independent Group on YouTube, and you can see Paul there, and he was such a star, uh, Paul, I was in the band with him, and uh, James Kirk, who's my best mate, really, that I've, that I've done a load of recording on holidays and things with. Um, uh, he was around last night, but he was in this band, Orange Juice. He was the guitarist then that kind of changed the Glasgow music scene, the Scottish music scene. Um, but, you know, me and James were always kind of best mates in this band. Uh, and it really, you know, people who worked in studios or were in the recording industry or, you know, music kind of, uh, you know, Justin or anyone would go along to these gigs and see that and go like, wow, that's, a, that's he's a better singer than anybody they can think of. They did records with Vince Clark and, uh, you know, tried to have hits and all that and it never came, out, came about. But then it kind of came down to kind of, you know, me and James were best mates and played in this, this band that was a kind of legendary thing. And then oh, James had this idea, uh, or we were both kind of starting to work in music together, really kind of before lockdown. Uh, 
you know, really kind of after the Delamitri time. And now we are this kind of engine of working together. At the time that lockdown was around, it was all about isolation thing. Mm. And we made this record and got all the best singers in, in uh, cause James made a record in, 1990, uh, in 2004. That was really about the, the mid nineties that we were working together in the postcard time. Um, but then in 2004, he made a record called uh, You Can Make It If You Boogie, uh, which is a great record, uh, but that all the people like Justin from Del Mitri and, uh, you know, Trash Can Sinatra singers and, uh, you know, all the kind of bands in Glasgow came up to the studio to sing in his record, uh, backing vocals and so on and play instruments and all that. And it was just that kind of idea of a collective helping a great record come out that became one of the real alternative, you know, magazine kind of things in their top 50 world. Uh, and it's a record worth checking out because it's great. And, you know, and I played on it and all that. And then oh, I just had this idea, we could do something, get these people back in again, you know, because we're not really singers. Uh, you know, James can sing a bit, but he's not that interested in it. And I can sing a bit, I'm not interested in it. But you get Justin to sing one song, you know, get the number one singer from there to sing it. But that was kind of... Uh, uh, just a kind of idea, and we, we released an album and it got four stars in the National Press and all that. It's hard to sell music these days, but um, we've now got a lot of names that are kind of international, you know, that are singers, but we're still always looking for people. Yeah. Right. Because uh, we just work, well, you know, just think of ideas nonstop. You know, if you look here uh, at, at where I am, right, there's a, there's a computer. Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a grand piano oh, there. Oh, wow, yeah. There's a microphone. There's a Korg, uh, Monopoly. There's some guitars over there. You know, there's some other, you know, bits and pieces of music. There's a wee keyboard down there. Where's the, accor where's the accordion, Andy? Where's the accordion? That's in the case. Yeah, out there, yeah. There's a, there's a concertina, yeah, that I play, you know, there's a cup. There's an accordion. I can see an accordion here, but that's not really the one I play. But the other ones, you know, I've got a few accordions. Yeah, uh -huh, but just that immediate thing, really, which is really different than the world of Delamitri, when you know, where there's a couch there that James sits on. He's the best guitarist in Scotland that some people see, and just there's a kind of real intimacy in a kind of band world, right? You know, like Justin and Ian, or Lennon McCartney. Uh, or Jagger and Richards, you know, it often comes down to that somebody you trust their kind of idea. You know, there's a lot of people in music shops who go like, oh, no, you're just playing that predictable thing or you're showing off too much in the music shop. They're not the people that you want uh, in guitar world um, and song world. And um, But just that kind of real intimacy about, oh, you can just pick up the accordion, you know, and there's no kind of, kind of thing back in recording in studios uh you know that you know i've, I've done a, a lot of that with delmetri and other bands but just there's a clock going around and say in a delmetri world well, you just play your keyboard part you know your organ piano kind of idea and then oh we're going to do acoustic guitars now you know or oh, we're going to do backing vocals then and it's really the the producer decides now we've got that that thing where if i'm just sitting here at night you know watching a you know something uh, then they can just have an idea and listen to something again and go like why don't i try a bit of accordion in that you know and the big thing with the computer is a delete key you know just like you you know you go and listen to it and you go like nah that's not a good idea <laughs> but you didn't really have that power in the studio world you know and it's made a big difference yeah mm -hmm. And so, and just while we're talking accordions, um, Andy, so ha, ha, you're quite obviously an accomplished accordion player. Where did your relationship with the accordion start? Like, how did you learn and get into that? Uh, that that really came from the on the first kind of uh, kind of accordion hit. Um, that was nothing ever happens. I didn't actually play that part. That was Blair Cowan that played that part. Who was in a band called the Commotions, and that so and it's his accordion actually that I bought. Uh, you know, he was, you know, he was doing this kind of music thing in, in this, uh, Loico and the Motions band. And then he, um, 
he decided to, he's still plays a bit of keyboards for the folk and all that, but uh, just Justin had this idea, uh, really, we're, we're kind of a rock band with a bit of something else, and it's an important kind of texture, and then, you know, if you can play keyboards, you can pick up an accordion, you know, and then if you work on something, you can just think about it, yeah, uh -huh. Yeah, I, no. I, you know, I, I just consider myself a bit of a bluffer on accordion, you know, but I, I you know, I can do it totally, but, um, but you see accordion players, you know, in Scotland or in Argentina or something, like, they're amazing. Uh, but yeah, I can play in a total rock and roll there, I play loads of records, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. But, you know, because it kind of started that way with another guy played it, and then you think, uh, and I really like that idea, in a kind of rock band way, you don't use the chordal kind of world, you just use the kind of melodic, you know, upper line kind of idea. Uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, because there's a bass player and, uh, you know, and a rhythm guitarist and all that, and it just works as this texture of kind of sadness in it. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, I like it as, I like it as that kind of uh, element, really. And I've, I, you know, now when I make records, uh, I kind of see it that way, you know, just, uh, it's not a starting point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you know, accordions, yeah. I feel like they've made a real comeback. They're, they're very much a, um, such a pivotal core instrument for so many recordings. And, and funnily enough, we had Ginny um, mm -hmm. Conley from the Decembrists on a couple of episodes and accordion is core to the right. Decembrists sound and so on. And, and obviously there are iconic bands like the Pogues, yeah. you know, there's so many great bands that use them. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh, and I think maybe at that time, you know, with Delamitri kind of starting in the, you know, the, the end of the 80s kind of time, that was really out of fashion, you know, really with all the DX7 kind of world and, you know, MIDI kind of thing, uh, oh, we've got an accordion sound there on the DX7, no, but it's, it's just like all the other horrible sounds on it, it's just, you can't, you can't believe it for a second, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So and so you mentioned that you mentioned nothing ever happens and uh, uh, the yeah the accordion is absolutely yeah. beautiful in that song. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really good part. And then I, you know, I thought of that uh, and I can play that like any uh, you know like uh, you know easily. But uh, you know then there's all the other things like uh, be my downfall or uh, tell her this or you know kind of accordions a big part in the song that uh, you know parts I came up with. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, absolutely. And so, um, so let's talk a little bit of Delamitri then. Obviously, so you've already uh, sort of talked about how you met. Um, did you actually have to formally audition? I suppose you'd already done the audition um, from what Justin saw. Well, I think Justin's first idea of you know he had this kind of because he came from you know this kind of punky idea really. Justin, although though people that are now familiar with Delmetri and whatever countries uh, maybe don't see Delmetri in that, that those light in that light. But the first Chrysalis album uh, with Delmetri is this kind of more spiky kind of guitar based thing. And then I thought he, he, he kind of really liked my playing, but then he saw me as a kind of icing on the cake kind of guy rather than the core guy. Uh, and, you know, when I was playing with other people, uh, you know, so it was just, the right kind of icing on the cake for him of somebody who wasn't a real egoist about showing off on the piano. Yeah, uh, that I can, I can totally do, but, uh, but he saw that, you know, the guitar band idea as central. So, uh, and then I, I was kind of a bit same detached, but then it just came, became a part of the band, you know, uh, and were you were you yeah. surprised, Andy, at how I, I'm not saying it took off quickly because obviously the band worked hard for a long mm -hmm. time, but were you surprised yeah. once it did take off how far it took off? I was surprised when I got to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, let, let's talk about that because I know you've mentioned in a previous um, magazine interview that um, Australia was one of your fondest tour tour memories. So yeah, tell us about your previous memories of Australia, and I, I suppose that's where. The, as you know, I, but for the sake of our audience, the reaction of Australians to Delamitri has been huge. Um, right, I know yeah. in those I, late I think, 80s, I think it was basically, huge. well, 
basically, we did a lot of get a lot of touring in America. I think, you know, just prior to Australia, and when you go to America, you know, just if you're you're young or whatever, you just got this this idea at the time from movies or whatever about hey, this is you know this is Miami Vice and that's all that, and just like you go there, it's it's largely uh, a big problem kind of country. Uh, and actually, when you go to places, and sometimes you might have that preconception in your head about places that relations live, you know, that like Canada and Australia, they're just kind of boring, you know. Uh, <laughs> the people you don't really talk to or communicate with in family ways who have just emigrated and live in boring houses. Uh, but then when you go there, uh, uh, you know, both Canada and Australia, you know, Canada kind of seems like what America should be, really. You know, without all the, the kind of guns and terrible poverty and division. Uh, and then Australia, it's kind of like America should be, but plus the sun and the sand and the koala bears. And the, you know, in a way, it's kind of like uh, uh, the colours turned on, you know. Uh, you know, the, from, certainly from Scotland, uh, yeah. Uh, but also, it was. I, I think when we done, uh, you know, a lot of tours in America that that were just kind of ascending in a way, uh, and they never really. Well, we had a top ten record in America, uh, rolled to me, but um, uh, in a way, America is kind of like Europe. There's just different countries in it. And in radio way, it's about keeping plates spinning, you know, to get a hit all round. You know, you can have a hit in Chicago, but it's not a hit in Miami. So, and if it's a hit after that, that doesn't make any, they've got to be all spinning at the same time so that people, and that's a, an arcane a record business craft. Uh, and it kind of worked, but it kind of didn't work, you know, uh, with certain regions in America. You know, certain certain reasons America were successful, but but basically, you know, via whatever television and and uh, radio in Australia, we came to Australia and it was like, oh shit, we're we're successful here, you know, when when you'd not really done the groundwork. So also, uh, so the gigs were all great. Um, uh, the hospitality was really good too, you know, uh, because there were, uh, you know, there's happy record companies. At that time, so oh, we got plenty of time off and go out in a boat and go and do things, you know, uh, go bungee jumping <laughs> and do completely stupid things like that, which are kind of fun. Uh, but and because this was like this was late eighties or early nineties, Andy, when you're in Australia. Yeah, it was ninety one. The first time I was there, I went there for a promo trip after. Um, and uh, about I really don't know about ninety three or something. I think it was ninety one, Australia the first time. Um, and, and I think I think you're you're absolutely right as far as the record companies and mm -hmm. and the itineraries were a little bit more flexible. We we had um, Alan Clark from Dire Straits on about mm -hmm. eighteen months ago, and he talked about mm -hmm. when Dire Straits toured Australia, he would walk from his hotel down and go um, surfing for the day and then walk back to the Sydney mm -hmm. Entertainment Centre and do sound check and play the gig. It was mm -hmm. certainly it was certainly a nice place to tour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember back then, we were staying in Sydney, we were staying in the Sable Townhouse. And just the, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. everywhere was, you know, just going in planes and things. <laughs> or else you'd go for a, go for a wander down to, uh, you know, uh, it's in the opera house or going a boat or some night, uh, you know, I can't, you know, just all that kind of time and luxury. It was quite good. Yeah. No, that's to see that and, and, you know, to kind of pretty much get off a plane. You don't know when you're going to Spain, is there going to be Andrew there? In Australia, there's somebody there that you don't know about yet already. Uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's right. No, that's, that's, got, that's, that's got right. a kind of itinerary, yeah. Mm. And it, it, I, I can't promise it'll be quite as exciting for this upcoming mm -hmm. tour, but hopefully we we, we have a great... I, I know you'll have a great reception and you're playing some significant yeah. size uh, venues and I imagine the, the tour is probably sold out. Um, so mm -hmm. I think it, I think it'll be a great mm -hmm. tour. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's... Mm -hmm. So let's talk more about you as a, a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so tell us about what 
you uh, you've sort of given us a tour already, which is great mm-hmm. uh, of of your key rigs. But on the yep. Delametri tour, what do you play, and you know what 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 are your go to uh, pieces? Uh, of gear? Well, it depends uh, if it's in the UK. You know, it's really about getting to Australia in a slightly restricted way now. Yeah, uh, uh, but in the UK, it's a bigger stage uh, or it's a bigger uh, crew kind of idea. Uh, I've got a you know, the basic thing, I've got more keyboards there. So I've got a Fender Rhodes uh, suitcase, a 73, that's really great. And it's kind of, these things that are kind of, I've got a Wurlitzer as well, but I, uh, that, I sometimes, that I use for recording. Uh, and I love the Wurlitzer, and I love, but I love the Fender Rhodes as well. But the Fender Rhodes, it's heavy as hell. But it is, uh, it, 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 uh, a Wurlitzer, if you take it around, it's more fragile. You know, just the the little tines. Uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, go out to and then it's not, and uh, and uh, you know, I remember I, when I used to, uh, you know, uh, play one a lot. Like, oh, you got to get the soldering iron out and all that to to fix a wallet, sir. But you don't really have to do that with a with a fender roads. So that's just road hard and it doesn't break. Um, yeah, and I've got a a. It's a Korg CX3. It's a transistor, uh, two manual organ, and I really like that. But it goes through uh, Leslie uh, one four seven. It's a big Leslie cabinet, yeah. and it's got that the a bit more cuttingness than a Hammond, but it sounds great through the Leslie. Uh, and sometimes I play guitar through the Leslie. It depends on what, what song I'm playing, um, and. Uh, I've got a a Nord stage uh, that I use basically for if I've got the Fender Rose, that does fine for electric piano sounds. Uh, but that's the the acoustic piano, basically, and a bit of synth. I play on that and a Nord Electro that I use for certain kind of harmonium things. Uh, and uh, but I kind of use the stage. I'll probably just have the stage in the Electro in Australia, you know, that, that kind of work with sounds. But I've also got a clavinet as well that I use, a real one. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, accordions, obviously, and a, a bit of her, um, melodica uh, that I play in some things. So so basically, you know, the, the basic idea is have a great organ sound, electric piano sound, and you know, for some things and a, a good accordion sound and a good, yeah, and a, a great kind of synth kind of, you know, uh, module kind of idea. Uh, but going to Australia, I think we'll just have two Nords, uh, you know, that can do the thing, uh, basically, because basically the in the Electro, say, which has got drawbars and all that, or some kind of drawbars, uh, the organ sounds are really good. And... Uh, I've got a, a a module kind of a Leslie cabinet thing for that. So you, if you got more crew, you know, to get these on stage, they can do. But they are a bit crazy nowadays, really. Uh, they are. It's a uh, uh, yeah. And even though you could backline roads and maybe a whirly and stuff in Australia, right? Mm-hmm. It's more the crew issue. Yeah. 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 So really, for a Delmetri world, you know, I, I remember I was in Germany. And it's kind of funny, these different worlds. I was with a different band a few years ago, um, and there somebody had hired gear. And oh, they'd hired these things like, uh, it was, I think it was an old DX7, and a Hoonor p t And just like, oh, one was through through an amp and all that. And just having real things is quite good. To, you know, on a stage, it, you know, in a kind of more rock and roll way, uh, makes you think, you know, you don't, you know, sample kind of things are you know of um, the your electro uh, your your Nord kind of world are great you know but for a kind of clubby kind of atmosphere that something that you're playing for real that's got kind of slightly weird sounds in it uh, is quite good uh, in in their world of kind of hiring gear uh, when, when it's quite unusual you know with with a band who've got kind of strange guitars and all that they they've had yeah uh, but really in a in a more kind of globalized way just bring your own portable gear over there mm-hmm. yeah it sounds to me andy you're not needing to 
uh, have anything uh, computer based. You know, you've got you've got a grasp of all the sounds. No, no, no. Basically, in a kind of Delamitri world, uh, you know, I remember playing at this place in Glasgow. At, uh, uh, it's called the Pyro. That's the big gig there. That uh, you know, it sees about fourteen thousand, uh, and you know, you have your real big acts on there, uh, and by and large, for the even bands like U two or something, there's a lot of people under the stage. There's a lot of other textures going on with computers and all that, and then we turn up for this kind of thing with Delmetra and with less trucks. You know, like, no, really, what you see on stage is what you what it is. There's no backing tracks. There's nothing. There's five guys on stage. Everything you hear is played by somebody, which is uh, great. Uh, I'm a big supporter of that. That's for sure. Yeah, and just just in a way, at, at any time with people, there's one or two times we've tried things. You know, with records that have got other things on them that, that have got kind of loopy things, and then ugh, there's more chance of it screwing up, and it, it's just it's just a headache, really. You know, really, even now, you know, if you're in a dance world, then you can you maybe get ways that is crucial, but really, just to be kind of flexible and whatever and the rock and roll way, it just is, is really annoying using yeah. the technology, really. And yeah. that's probably a good segue, Andy, to one of our common questions, which. Uh, we ask our guests to recall a musical train wreck that's happened in the middle of a gig. So is there some memorable time on stage where things have gone terribly wrong for you? Uh, well, I wouldn't say technically because the roadies always kind of do things, you know, and, I, I, you know, and make it, you know, I, if there's any kind of troubleshooting beforehand, it's done. But I can remember one time, this is kind of stupid, but... Uh, that we've been doing this, you know, some I've been played by a band for a lot, a lot of years and different tours. And okay, we stopped for about twenty years or something, but uh, you know, we did a lot of touring before that, you know, uh, and uh, you know, there's an order in a set, and we always used to finish with a song called "Kiss a Sing Goodbye," you know, for uh, not 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 in it, but really maybe for about five years or something, you know. And then just into this one idea, uh, we're going to swap the set. You know, you do a, a fair bit of swapping, but well, that's quite a good end summer. End summer. So I think yeah, you can guess what's going to happen. We put that song number five. <laughs> it was at the bar last week. Let's go. You've done the, you've done the end of it. No. <laughs> But it was, it was, get back on stage. You know, you, you've got just got this kind of muscle memory of, of right, the gig's over. Well, well, how did the audience react, Andy? Were they going, well, that was a short gig? Uh, no, I don't think they really. It was really my keyboard roadie that, you know, they don't, they're looking at Justin or whatever, and then there's a big kind of, you know, cheering point. Or maybe it's a, it's a way to get a beer of water or something like that and just like joining in and the kind of wavy hand waving thing but i really did think the gig was over <laughs> that's great uh, that's the first um instance we've heard of that. that's brilliant i love that and mm -hmm. yeah that's that's excellent. yeah i think it's a uh, it's time to anyone <laughs> well probably wouldn't but yeah uh, uh, and um just just a left of center question um Andy, I know one of your career milestones that I, I've heard mentioned that you used to, in your teaching uh, role, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. you used to teach or assist jail inmates to record music. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, does that still occur or that was sort of in the recent past? No, I, I decided to take it. I, I actually went there as a maths teacher. Ah. Yeah. You know, you just uh, apply for a thing, and and then the the boss there thinks you're great and all that. But then you go in a cupboard there. There's a bunch of guitars and things, and you know microphones. There must be an audio interface. Uh, you know, there's there's just these old kind of Dell computers or whatever. I think I must have uh, gone to buy an audio interface. You know, you kind of see the possibility. Of technology, they're not allowed computers in their cells or in their in the halls or in the you know the but they come to education. They're doing word processing or or whatever um, or maths or whatever. And then, but no computers. Uh, if you bring in uh, you know Reaper, I brought in then, uh, and in a way, you know, I came up with this idea, uh, 
and uh, you know, because there was a guitar teacher there. I never met the guitar teacher. I was just teaching different days. Uh, but basically, some of these guys are really good. You know, it's not somebody that's got to show. Oh, this is a D chord. This is a G chord. This is a C chord. Right now, we'll string together. It was, it was stand by me or something in a kind of group when nobody's played guitar. That's fine. But some of the guys can play like hell. You know, there have already been people uh, done things and all that, and and some of them are kind of songwriters. You know, with ideas, uh, so they're like, that's a really crucial thing. It can be a part of your personality, of create creativity, uh, and okay, let's let's start. Uh, let's think about recording. And I, I was basically still employed as a math teacher uh, there, uh, but I was, I was spending half my time recording, and, and um, I had this idea. Uh, uh, let's uh, let's make an album. You know. With the guys inside, and and there was actually there's an American uh, uh, kind of legendary record made in nineteen something like nineteen sixty seven uh, that was made by Jalen mates somewhere, and it's you know kind of got that Motown feel and all that, and a bit of that kind of chain gang kind of you know they're brilliant singers and all that, you know from that time uh, in their world, but there's a lot there's people with uh, you know there's a few people in there. I was like, you can write songs that are really good, you know, because they're about your experience of life or some. They're about your, oh, you're married to so and so and you're whatever, and then they're you were in doing music things, and then you all the time of just, you know, writing ideas, uh, uh, and I thought I can make a really good record to that, but um, and it actually kind of taught me, in a way, about the kind of. You know, you start with one idea, but then oh, you think, oh, that'd be quite good with a bit of violin in it or something, or, you know, a collaborative um, uh, addition process. Uh, uh, but basically, it's the, the, the manager at the time, he thought, oh, that's really good and all that. But then, uh, and I, I did think uh, uh, 12 tracks, all killer. No filler, because they were all killers. <laughs> Some of them are drug dealers. Uh, <laughs> That's a great album no, just, title. That's great, though. Yeah, yeah. But then getting that out into the world is impossible, really. Yeah, it's important because there's the Scottish prison service that are just like, there are victims of these people, <laughs> yes. even if you anonymize it. You know, because they've got also they've got mobile phones. They've got pictures like I'm singing a thing, and just like you do something, they they would recognise the voice or something. That you know, it's just like um, uh, it's a good creative idea, and sometimes maybe for ideas that that process is a thing that outcome is too difficult to because outcome means it goes public. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that's a great uh, point. I hadn't thought of that, Andy. That's a really yeah. important yeah. point. Um, it seems yeah. to me, though, that would be an ideal movie script. To me, that's a movie waiting to be made. Yeah, and actually, actually you know, it kind of, you know, there was one guy in there, I just thought, you write songs that are amazing. And I remember playing this to Justin, and he was like, shit, that's really good. You know, just like, somebody who writes songs goes like, wow, the kind of words... And that and the melody are kind of mysterious and good, you know. And so most of the guys were just like, "Okay, we can do it. We can figure it out." Or, you know, it's a teaching thing, but it's a collaborative enterprise. Uh, uh, that I use some of those ideas still, you know. I, I you know, there's one song I, I did with two prisons in there, and I think that's fucking beautiful. Uh, and I'm gonna get a girl to sing it. Yeah, you know, I've already kind of recorded the the violin thing and all that, and you know, and got James Blaze guitar and all that, and it. And the drums and all that. Yeah, that's an amazing thing that a lot of players, yeah, won't have had had the experience of it. Yeah, I love that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and Andy, just as far as what you mentioned, you learned some stuff from that process. What What are some mm-hmm. key lessons if someone's coming into playing keyboard, accordion, uh, and and want to you know make a career out of it? Are there any lessons you'd want to pass on to other players? I would say, uh, yeah, I would say nowadays uh, uh, the crucial things you got to do. To be a creative person, in a way, is learn a, a little, you know, about, in a way, I, well, I did. Uh, you know, it, it was called, uh, in, in the UK, grade one piano. And that's just be able to read music, 
be able to play some scales, and then once you can can read um, one of the simple back, really simple back things, then you got enough abilities inside you to read anything. You can get, you can find a whole bunch of resources online, but you can even do it without reading. But I would say reading is really good. Um, but then you can think about chords, uh, and you know the classical thing doesn't tell you anything about chords, but learning, you know, the way I did kind of a bit of kind of uh, blues and jazz, is is a good thing to do. But what you can really do now, if you learn up to that level of kind of grade one, is just get a. Um, I mean, I've just got a computer anyway. Uh, you know, I was young, um, but you know, some kind of uh, program, and just try things out. You know, really, when you you know, I do teach some people about this, some young folk, which is really like, like we, you know, just try writing things. You know, immediately, really. And, uh, you know, there's there's some people I teach that aren't interested in that at all. They just want to go down the kind of classical route and I can go that that way. But some people are. And really just uh, try something out. But, uh, you know, little ideas and try putting a drum pattern along with it and uh, try layering it, you know, with the bass part. Um, and then export an MP3 and, and listen to it on your phone and take it around and then think about it again. You know, basically, it's better than the big studio world, uh, where you don't really necessarily have a connection to what you do because there's you you know there's double glass there and there's engineers there and you know they maybe talking in a foreign language or something uh, and you get headphones on, but no, you've got that responsibility and you can come back and say and say oh, it might be better if that wasn't repeated if it was different the second time, in a way. All of these things are endless journeys. You know, if you want to go down your, your world of Bach or something, that never finishes. Uh, or Beethoven, that never finishes. Uh, or jazz, that never finishes. Or blues. But if you want to go down the recording route that's got synthesizers and things in it, oh, then you can learn about filtering. You can learn about uh, LFOs. You can learn about, you know, that you know, these things are, there's a load of uh, parameters to that. Or you can learn about accordions. You know, you can learn about, uh, concertinas, you can learn about the more kind of acoustic world, but the what the keyboard gives to you is all of that really, where guitars don't really give you that, you know, guitars don't really unlock that world, and in a way what people do is they do what they do, and just even if you're in a band, you know, I would never sit in the drummer's seat, you know, Delamitri, you know, if you're in a quite successful band, if you maybe in a tiny band, you would do that, but you just don't sit in somebody else's seat in a reasonable professional role, and that makes you think I can't do that. You can do it, but being a keyboard player, you can play the accordion, you can play the sin, you can play in that's got a keyboard. You know, nobody else can do that. That that is it's yeah that that is brilliant advice mm -hmm. and that's yeah really well mm -hmm. summarised. It, it's like you teach people for a living, Andy. The way you summarise that that was mm -hmm. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's yeah. excellent. Thank you. And just related to that, we all also ask our guests to tag a keyboard player. So you know, is there a keyboard player over your career that you've admired that you've always wanted to find out more about their story? Oh, there's certain players. Uh, you know, from uh, jazz world, or you know, you know, Basie is somebody I love, you know, so much because he just he plays less and it's more, you know, and there are things I hear even now, you know, just brand new things I find on YouTube. I go like, fuck me, that is just like, I know a load of Basie kind of hits it, but now I think when you look at things on YouTube. You know, if these, uh, you know, if keyboard players do, then that comes up in your kind of purview on YouTube, really, that uh, there's something that you hadn't seen before that's really unusual. Uh, uh, and just like the way Basie does things, I think it's amazing. Uh, I, I mean, I, I love players like Monk and um, or, or Professor Longhair, you know, playing his uh, kind of New Orleans style. 
I mean, they're they're three pretty they're they're th- three pretty decent picks, Andy. Those. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was saying, I was saying. Uh, there's a lot of others I, I listen to, but they, you know, bass is number one. I'd say almost. Yeah, yeah. No, mm. that that's brilliant. And mm. um, and we also have the dreaded Desert Island Discs question, Andy. So five yeah. albums that have really uh, had an impact on your life. What what would they be? I think these these five things are, are reasonable. They are, they are actually in a way kind of summarise me. In a way, uh, there there's one album by an artist called Keith Hudson, who's a reggae. Uh, artist and it's a kind of dub thing called Studio Again Kind of Cloudy uh, I, I also I also really love Scientist who's that kind of dub musician I really like that kind of sound world of these things so that's you know not not the, not necessarily the drug kind of thing but really about that kind of like whoa you're doing something radical with delay and uh, studio processing that I'm kind of really interested in going down that route uh, I also there, there's a Tammy Wynette record I really love um, called Til, Till I Make It On My Own and I really love Tammy singing and I really love the Billy Shirell production of that. I don't really like Tammy, you know, in, you know, into the 90s, but I love that kind of mid-70s Billy Shirell and love the songs on that record too much. And I actually, I've written a couple of country songs. I really... I'd, I, um, I, I do really like country, you know, there's a, a story about, well, because my next album is um, by Charles Mingus, and that's a modern jazz symposium of using poetry, that's a 1959 record by him, but there's a, there's a few numbers on that, there's, uh, well, there's, there's one called New York Sketches, everybody should listen to that, that's beautiful, it's a kind of, it's got to be a wee bit of a, a, a narrative, in it. Was, uh, there's an actor leading the story about living in a flat and there's somebody playing jazz music upstairs and then this beautiful melody comes down and says I love jazz you know and it, uh, but it's got some other good, really good tracks on it New Rog and uh, I can't remember the rest of them um, uh, another uh, record on a fourth uh, would be um, Barry White Let the Music Play I love that album I love every track on it. I particularly love uh, Let the Music Play, the longer version on the record. Uh, you hear him uh, uh, coming to the door. He's in the, the stars of the record. Uh, he's, he's walking. as this kind of street sound thing. And the, the, the drums are kind of coming in all that. And uh, uh, so there's the bouncer at the door. And he says, one ticket, please. And the bouncer says, uh, uh, where's she? She is home. She is home. And then the music, let the music play. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, but everything on, uh, I really like Barry White's records. Uh, I really, you know, I love that. I remember at Del Meter, I was touring America and I was show, I was playing a lot of this kind of stuff to the drummer uh, at the time, Mark Price. And it, he was going, there's hardly any, you know, there's no fills. Or, you know, just it's so subtle. I was saying, that's the key thing. You know, they're, they're, that's the disco thing, really. It's just perfect, and I, I remember looking at a thing on on YouTube of a Barry White thing that uh, uh, somebody had said, "Oh, that's the you know somebody who's that whatever age has said that's the first time I saw a black guy conducting an orchestra." You know, it was Barry White doing his thing. You know, these t- kind of you add that violin. Well, it was a guy Gene Page did the the violin arrangements, but you add that class into it to disco. Uh, you know, it's kind of what Cheek did. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm interested in that world as well. Um, and the last, the last uh, uh, record was The Chronic by Dr. Dre. Because I really like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, I yeah mean, that's a, that's an amazing pick. eclectic pick to go from Tammy Wynette mm-hmm. Barry White to Dr. Dre. That just shows the breadth of your, your knowledge and um, taste. That's amazing. Yeah, but you should really, well, you know, the, everybody would know The Chronic, but you should check out the other things. The other things are beautiful. That Tammy Wynette album, is is one of her best albums, you know. I think it's nineteen seventy six, and she's really great then. But the songs on that, there's one in the side two called "The Heart." I love that song. I love to uh, uh, to make it my own. Uh, you know the 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 starting song, but the song in side two, the first song, and that I really love. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
and uh, but, uh, but that 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 Charles Mingus, uh, you know, so a lot a lot of Charles Mingus records I like, but that particular one, you know, with that New York sketches on it is really no, great. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely mm-hmm. be listing those. So that yeah, yeah great. And look, I, I'm selfish, Andy. I get such a buzz out of hearing these albums because I go and explore them myself. So from a selfish mm-hmm. viewpoint, it's brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. And then, so we're down to our last two questions, Andy. Just, I mean, you've you've been with Delamitri since 1989, and mm-hmm. you know, there's been a fairly stable lineup. What what is the secret to everyone getting on? Because we're all, most of our listeners, including myself, are in bands. It can be challenging mm-hmm. at times. What's the secret to the success of getting on? I think we 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 always. I think all bands are kind of different. You know, worlds. They're all families. What's the secret to getting on with your brothers? I talk on to my brothers, you know, just like, like all families are different. But uh, and Delamitri, uh, you know, when you know when we were touring recently, uh, there's our tour manager is a guy called Derek Fudge, and he'd just been on tour uh, in Europe with um, Tom Jones, uh, and he said that was kind of awkward to fit. You know, these bigger tours, uh, you know, that sometimes that. Oh, somebody's bullying somebody, or that that you know, or whatever you or where do you fit in? Uh, whose seat do you sit in, and all that? And then with Delmitri, everybody gets on, and he liked doing. He liked coming back to that world. You know, I've known Justin uh, and Ian forever. Uh, not 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 for as long as Ian's known Justin, but um, I can easily hang out with Justin, no problem. Uh, uh, I and, and everybody's got their own kind of. Uh, way of being it's, it's really me and Jim the drummer uh, hang out in the bus uh, uh, and uh, uh, party a bit uh, uh, and, and Ian does sometimes as well and, and uh, Chrissy has travelled to sleep on tour but everybody gets the one you know in a way it's a kind of happy family uh, but people have got their own independent uh, career ideas of playing with different people but there's no kind of uh uh, no friction at all. Uh, yeah, that's right. yeah. Uh, so, so I, I can't really think. Uh, you know, just because, you know, every band's its own, every family's its own thing, and yeah. you get that person could they can play like hell, but then to end up in in places where you really like what people do, but you like them as people, yeah. There's no necessary connection between those two things. Yeah, and I, and I think I think in these things. Uh, really, even as somebody that can play like hell, uh, and and you can't stand them, you get rid of them. You yeah. know, the personal thing's so important. You know, we've had people in the band before that just haven't really, or you know, Justin, they they were the wrong guitars to you for that time. Yeah. Uh, no, mm-hmm. no, great, great perspective. And then our final question is sort of a multi-part one, Andy, and it's what we call the quick fire ten. And so, okay, just yeah. ten, 10 little bits we ask you to provide a quick response to. So, sure. Um, yeah. I th- uh, first keyboard you ever owned was a Honor PNT. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, most important pre gig ritual for you? We used to do this thing with Delamitri, with, with Brian, who was a drummer, uh, that he was on some, he was involved in some terrible business. <laughs> Place small business place. We started this thing. Reach for the pauses. Uh, we all joined hands. Reach for the pauses. Shake out the neggies and stamp on them. <laughs> Which was you were in some workplace that you had to do that. Uh, that he taught us to do. We don't do that anymore. We did it with him, but that was a that's funny pre gig thing. That, that's yeah. gold. Keytar, um, <laughs> k- sexy or an abomination? An abomination. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, transpose button or adjust the key on the fly. Adjust the key on the fly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. f- favorite gig you've ever done? Probably the Barlands in Glasgow. And yeah. I, I know in a previous interview you mentioned that just an iconic venue, and yeah, you just love mm-hmm. it. Yeah, it's, that's great. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of other nice cities, but yeah, Barlands, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Fa- favorite gig you've ever attended as an audience member? I'll uh, I'll talk about this one. Um, right, I would say in a way of a recent one. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gigs uh, of other gigs you think about. Just about a recent one that really made an impression on me was Burt Bacharach uh, in Glasgow uh, when um, 
there, there's a place here that we're playing in in uh, uh, August. Uh, it's it's called Kelm Grove. It's open air. It's beautiful. You know, I think they've kind of got these things in Europe. But I remember I was there with, uh, uh, you know, the, somebody else was singing there, uh, a girl, and she was like, this is the most beautiful place. I've played in, you know, some days I had kind of international stars. It's in a park and there's a river behind and it's sparkly lights and all that. And it's glass when you can see the university and everything there. Uh, but Burt Bacharach there, you know, he's a beautiful band and he's got these beautiful songs. And it got me thinking about the, I was, ta I remember talking to a friend there, you know, I loved what everybody did and I loved the, the song world of it. And I loved his piano playing and, uh, but the song arrangements and the magic of it and the transportation of it, um, where, uh, you know, I was thinking about, I was talking to a friend, uh, what were you listening to when you're listening to this? It's all magic going on. You know, I was thinking, some people are listening to lyrics. Some people are listening to other things. And I was thinking, I'm listening, because I'm listening to the chord changes, you know, because he actually said that night uh, that he never really, he tried rock and roll, but he couldn't really do it, you know. He was in this kind of more show, you know, uh, kind of uh, movie soundtrack way of songs. And you thought, like, and then he, he did one of his songs, it was kind of rock and roll song. That's about shit, really. Uh, but the other songs take you back to the magic, really, of it, uh, of, the, of the, the kind of construction of the songs. And best, best thing about playing live? Uh best thing i would say in a way in a way playing live uh, you know playing live play, playing live is much is, is just getting much more and more important i do a lot of recording you know every bloody week really uh but in a way when i've got people around here in my flat i'm playing live that's real you know if i'm playing on a stage that's real as well but it can just be people sitting around listening or chatting or singing or something. You know, it really is presentness. Uh, you know, being in, in itself as an idea from Heidegger, really, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a word Dyson he, he used for, you know, if somebody's working uh, on a, if somebody's writing in a university or something, they're doing something, if somebody's working a lathe in a kind of, uh, we, they're they're just doing exactly what they're doing. They could bloody take their fingers off if they do it wrong, but that's kind of like the piano. You've got just got to do it right there. If you're if you're recording something on a computer, or if you're writing an essay on a computer, oh, you can change that bit again and again. But if you're doing it there and then, it's got to be magic there and then. Yeah, there's great. no there's no kind of revising the present. Yeah, great answer. And and the wor mm. the worst thing about playing live, I think I don't think there are really are worse. I mean, just uh, you know, maybe, uh, and maybe if it's touring, there's there's kind of boring bits of that, or you know, uh, difficult things about that. But they're not really that that difficult. I don't really know. I mean, sometimes you can make mistakes or something. But uh, I think that I think I, I think playing live, playing live is really where the money is in the music now. You know, recordings really you earn nothing from yeah uh uh you know or tuition or something you earn, earn money from uh yeah and that's kind of live there's no there's no worse thing about it really mm -hmm. yeah no mm -hmm. fair enough and then um mm -hmm. name name one thing you'd like to see invented that to make your life as a keyboard player easier yeah, well i think i think all the things i think of will be invented you know, it's, uh, Moore's law of technology means it will be. Yeah. Uh, somebody's actually working on it now, but you know, I could say a grand piano you can fit into uh, a, an iPad, but there already is, is one. You know, or um, I'm just looking at the things, but I really, I really like the the physicality of them. I, I'm just trying to think in a way, I, in a way, there's things that are quite light to be invented that I'm glad aren't invented, like a violin that I can play. But it will never be there because the violin's there. It's kind of like I'd like to uh, invent a diamond uh, saxophone or something. But you know, it just will never. It's just a. It'd be such a stupid. You know, it'd be such a stupid thing to try and make a violin sound with a keyboard. You know, 
or a saxophone sound with a keyboard. I just get the great saxophone players into this room. That's right. And do it that way. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think if there was going to be a diamond saxophone, Prince would already have had it invented in the 80s. Yeah, I did see uh, uh, there was some girl playing a, a glass flute from the 17th century or so. That in, oh, in yes, the, that was, yeah. yeah, I know exactly who you mean. Yes, that was only yeah. recently in the last six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Don't, I, think, I think music is, is, is that's what it is. And, you know, synthesizers, they're quite great. I love uh, I love that synthesizer. I can see right here from now that's an ancient thing. I think somebody will invent something because, uh, you know, I'm not really, there are people that work, work hard in this world that's, you know, I, I'm looking at a world that's inherited from uh, Bach's world, basically, you know, in the piano kind of world um, and the string world and all that and the synthesizer world that was invented in the 70s. There's people invent things just now and some of these are just going to knock our socks off, you know, which we don't know what they're going to do. Uh, but they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have, I can see a thing with all these LFOs there and all that, but there'll be other things that we've not thought of because the ways to manipulate sound, you know, are, you know, the things that um, uh, Ableton Live kind of controller surfaces use are kind of, and there's different things for disabled people or so that I know people who work with in music therapy that, that are, we just get one model, they work like this, and then if somebody is in a creative, scientific way inventing something that I don't know about, it's a different kind of, kind of control surface, or it, it's got a keyboard, and that way uh, of manipulating smells or something, or colours or something like that, yeah, just, uh, or some kind of parameter of sound. Uh, yeah, no, it's, and, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a great answer. And this, yeah, you're mm-hmm. right. There's so much on the horizon. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last part, your favourite non-musical activity or hobby. What keeps you sane outside of music, Andy? I would say um, uh, cycling and climbing. Yeah, uh, you that's know, un- that's, that's, un- that's unlike a Scotsman to want to climb. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, there's uh, there's mountains in Scotland. Uh, you know that's I, I'm going to New Zealand. Uh, oh, yeah, well you're set then. Yeah. Well, I don't think I'm gonna. You know, basically all that time when I was in Delmetria, I would play on stage. If I'm in Denver, Colorado, I'm heading for the hills. I, I did. You know, there's a flat iron in uh, Denver. I've been up that a few times. Uh, in New Mexico, I, I, you know, everybody else would go to the shops. Or I, I'm going up the hill. Yeah. If I can see one, I'm going to climb it. I'll get taxi there and climb it. I, I. And j- j- just don't go looking for a hill when you're in Perth down here, Andy. You won't find one. Uh, no, no. I've not. I, I, in Australia, I've been there before. Uh, there's a beach. I get a bit bored in the beach, but um, uh, maybe over on uh, you know, the other coast. Uh, but it's all. Uh, uh, it's, it's really a beautiful. There's beautiful countryside you get through. In Australia, uh, maybe I'll do walk about when I'm there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, I cannot cannot thank you enough for taking the time. Um, I know Australians are very excited to have have you out um, at the end of February. I, I know I'm certainly going. I've bought tickets, and I'm I'm very much Excellent, looking yeah. forward looking forward mm. to it. Um, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, wait, wait, um, what what city are you, what city are you in? Are you in Perth? Uh, uh, oh yeah, so no, I'll be at the Enmore Theatre in Sydney, which is a. I, right. I was about okay. to say you will. I was about to say you will love that theatre, but compared to European theatres, Australia, you know, doesn't have anything of that beauty. But the Enmore Theatre is one of the more. Oh, beautiful well, it's a good theatre. Yeah. yeah. I, uh-huh. Now I remember one in, in Melbourne. I I think we played before. I don't really remember. But I kind of remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, some beautiful theatre. So now we look. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you, and um, you, you've had and an also also. Career. The, these theatres are by the beach, you know. Just <laughs> they are. They are indeed. <laughs> That's yeah. actually odd. And there we have it. I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. It was great talking to Andy. And I do want to apologise in advance to all our US and Canadian listeners. I quite often get feedback on the strength of the Australian accent and Paul's and my Australian accents. So between Andy and I with our Scottish and Australian accents, I'm sure we've provided some linguistical challenges to you 
um, over the other side of the Pacific and Atlantic, depending on where you are. So, but thank you for sticking with it because Andy's experiences were, were absolutely amazing to hear. So we'll be back again in a couple of weeks, but in the meantime, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our gold and silver supporters in reverse order. Radio Grande, a great YouTube channel devoted to bring you funk and soul reimaginings of iconic songs. Highly recommend you check them out. They've got another one about to go live, but they've got a library of, of some amazing covers of great songs. Um, a big shout out to the musicplay.com forums. Um, definitely go to musicplay.com and check that out if you're interested in keyboards and want to talk to some very experienced people about their experiences. Um, Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew, highly recommended on Facebook. Do have a search for that. Some great shows covering a whole bunch of musical genres. Um, yeah, very beautifully curated. Thank you, Tammy. And then last but definitely not least, Brother Paul Brown from The Water Boys. Thank you, Brother Paul, as always, for your ongoing support. So, yeah, big thank you to all our gold and silver supporters. Uh, we'll be back, as I said, in a couple of weeks. Our website, as always, is www.keyboardchronicles.com. We're on Facebook under the same name. Twitter and editor at keyboardchronicles.com is our email address. Very quick shout out for Patreon, patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. It really does help us keep the boat afloat if you could spare a couple of dollars per month. Uh, so a huge thank you to for joining me this episode. It is always appreciated. It's why we do what we do. And we'll see you back here again very soon. <laughs> Thank you.